Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. In December 2015, I attended a workshop in Nashville, Tennessee. The workshop itself was quite tedious. There were endless slides, countless examples, and this stream of TV commercials that had nothing to do with what we were learning, which was about websites. However, there were these long lunch breaks, and they were long, like an hour and a half. With little to do after lunch, I would just wander around the lobby I look at the signs that were posted on the walls. The signs were quotes from prominent American politicians. And one of them was attributed to the US President John F. Kennedy. It simply said, if not us, who? If not now, when? No one seemed to know if John F. Kennedy said it or not. And yet, for me, at that moment, the quote was relevant. I'd wanted to get certain things done. I'd wanted to write some specific books on talent, books on teaching, you know, the stuff on teacher versus preacher. And this sign seemed to slap me in the face. It wasn't for me who would do it. If not now, when would it get done? And yet here we are all of these months, actually a couple of years later, And that battle, it just rages on. So many other projects get done, but some remain almost permanently on the to-do list. How could I, I wondered, make things happen? It was time to take stock. I soon realized that business, at least my business, had five permanently competing forces. To achieve what I wanted, I could only focus on one and leave the others sulking in the corner. This wasn't a problem of focus, it was a question of management. For me to feel that profound sense of achievement with every passing year, I know that I have to deal not with just one or two, but with all of these five forces, they're all going at me at the same time, they're all competing for my attention. And it's not like I haven't tried it before, I've tried to let some of them go, but they keep coming back. So let's list the five forces. The first one is learning by doing. The second is learning by learning. The third one is revenue generation and client retention. Then we have passion projects. And finally, downtime. Let's start out with the first force of business, which is learning by doing. Stop for a moment and think of something that kills 842,000 people a year. That's a whopping 2,300 people per day. You didn't think of water, did you? Water isn't supposed to kill, it's supposed to give life. And yet, year after year, like a mutant Jack the Ripper, it goes around taking lives of people. No one, it seems, is interested enough to stop this killer. No one except for Dean Kamen. We could empty half of all the beds in all the hospitals in the world by just giving people clean water. And Kamen is one of the people that are uniquely placed to take up this challenge. In Manchester, New Hampshire, where he lives and works, he's known for his invention of the Segway. But the Segway is only one invention. Cayman has over 440 patents to his name, and it's clean water that has got his attention. Which is why he set about creating the Sterling Engine. The Sterling Engine is so amazing, it can generate clean, drinkable water even from contaminated water. Water contaminated with mud, with bacteria, with human-filled feces. For most people, creating products of such grand simplicity 
would be completely impossible, completely insurmountable. They would think of this as a barrier that they could not get across. But not for Cayman. Cayman came up with this machine, this working machine, a machine that needed only the power of a dryer, a hair dryer. And if necessary, it could even work on fuel sources such as cow dung. The product was ready, the challenge was met. It was then that Cayman ran into his first major hurdle. For 15 years, Cayman struggled to get his sterling machines mass produced and then distributed around the world. This was no ordinary invention. We have only 3% of the world covered with water. Water is probably going to be more expensive than oil someday. And there are people dying all the time. You'd think everyone would jump up and down waiting and wanting his invention. And yet all came and got was polite smiles and closed doors. The World Bank, the UN, the World Health Organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, many governmental agencies, NGOs, they all realized the problem, but they couldn't help. Too many of these organizations were not set up to help mass manufacture or to distribute Cayman's machine. And, of course, they are needed in the poorest part of the world. Now, this is the first challenge in our business. We need to learn by doing. At Psychotactics, I've conducted the article writing course since 2006. It's called the toughest writing course in the world, and for a good reason. For three months, clients have to slog to get to the finish line to be able to write an article in between 60 to 90 minutes. For me, that workload is magnified several times over. Every day, I have to look at 25 assignments and lots of questions relating to those assignments. The course itself generates no fewer than 600 articles, all of which have to be read and evaluated. It's not just the toughest course for the clients, it's also a mind-bending course for me as a trainer. So why do it? The course isn't cheap at over $3,000, but it's not the revenue that's the biggest driver. Because if you took away the live article writing course, which is conducted online, and then you said, okay, let's create one or two products. Those one or two products would create a greater profit without all of this hard work. So why do this? And the answer is in the doing. By teaching that course time after time for the past 10 years, I've learned something that I could not know or experience by just writing just a course, just by writing that course. I had to create home study courses. I had to realize what goes through the mind of a customer. And what if I weren't around, how would they deal with it? And so the home study courses and the live courses, they're in place because of this learning by doing. Every course brings up brand new challenges, all of which have to be tackled. It's the problems that create enormous spikes in learning. And all of this is frustrating because the secrets of teaching, the secrets of learning, they are so frustratingly slow. And then I push myself into yet another iteration, another version of that course over and over again, year after year. Without doing that, I'd have no learning, no way to overcome the barriers, no way to know what is going on through the mind of someone who is possibly just doing the home study without me looking over their shoulder the whole time. Cayman's 15-year learning journey to deliver clean water ended in a very interesting place as well. The NGOs and the UN doesn't go into the tiny villages, so there is this big organizational problem. However, no matter where you go on the planet, you can always get yourself a bottle of Coca-Cola. In exchange for a redesign of their age-old dispensing machines, Cayman teamed up with Coke, and he took these sterling machines to the far edges of the planet. That's not as if to say there weren't more challenges in getting the device to work. Nonetheless, all of these issues can only be overcome by doing. 
It's the reason why you and I, we need to be doing stuff. It's the reason why some of us create podcasts. It's the reason why we keep doing stuff, even when at times it's plainly disheartening to go on. It's in the doing that we learn the lessons. The reason why so many people fail is because you have to persist for a while before the oceans part and you can walk through on the other side. It's not like Dean Kamen isn't well connected. He is directly in touch with prominent organizations, US presidents, well-known figures. Even so, it's taken him a solid 15 years to find any traction. But you and I are attacked with advertisements every single day that tell you that you can double your results, you can double your results, you can double your results, and you think that it's going to happen tomorrow. And the problem is that we feel like losers when things don't happen overnight. At Psychotactics, we've had to learn by doing We've held workshops in New Zealand, in the US, in Europe, in parts of Europe, in Amsterdam, in the UK. Every workshop is a super challenge. So why not just sit back and conduct an entire online course? Why not do the simplest thing possible? The answer is in doing. You learn most when you push your boundaries. All of this earth-shaking work, it takes energy, it takes time. If you look at a workshop, for instance, it takes a month of preparation, it takes a month of travel, it takes a month of re-entry time, and it's all learning by doing. It's very difficult to make big leaps in your work. It's very difficult to stand out in the way that you want to by simply taking tiny steps all the time. It's these big steps that cause the greatest chaos. If you were on the article writing course in 2016, it would have been just the course. But if you were part of the alumni doing the course, you might have been slightly horrified. The entire course had changed. The assignments that were usually in week 11 showed up in week 4. Whole systems that were used in earlier courses were just dropped. And they were replaced by another system. Was the new system tested? Of course not. It's what learning by doing is often about. When you make significant changes, there's no way to know how something will work. There's no way to know that it'll work right away. You're supposed to improvise, and it pushes you completely to that limit. Learning by doing easily sucks up most of the time in a business. Dean Kamen is a multimillionaire. He flies to work every day by helicopter. He has earned more than enough fame and money to never have to work again. He's taken on this challenge to prove that clean water could indeed reach the poorest, furthest parts of the planet. And the only way that he could achieve all of this activity was by putting himself on the sword and keeping at it. It's the core of what drives the business. Doing stuff even when the odds are against you. And it's where you learn the most. But that's only one form of learning. There's also the relatively less strenuous form of learning, and that too can suck up a lot of time. And that is learning by learning. So let's go to the second part where we examine what is this learning by learning. Why is Australia hot? Why is Antarctica cold? About four years ago, Renuka and I launched into what was one of the big life-changing decisions. We decided to mentor my niece, Marsha. And Marsha had a million questions. Some like these, which is, why is Antarctica cold? Why is Australia hot? Now we have two shifts. Renuka starts off with Marsha and she goes through several things like maths and Then after that, she's handed over to me, and we go and sit on the floor. We sit near the sofa, we eat cheese, we eat carrots, we eat almonds. And Marsha has questions, she has lots of questions. So in the process, I've learned a lot about clouds, about countries, about their capitals, about geology, about biology, history even. I learned that Antarctica and Australia were once connected. 
they had the same endless forests of Glossopteris. And that with the drifting of continents, Australia moved north. Now this created space for the Southern Ocean. As Australia floated away, the ocean currents had no landmass barriers. So they started to spin. And they spun, and they spun, and they spun around Antarctica. And as they spun around, they increased their speed. And Antarctica had this mild climate. It was full of forests. It was full of stuff like a green, beautiful place. And then about 17 million years ago, it became cold. That current created the climate, that cold, frozen, what we would call a wasteland. It created that ocean current, and it was all because Australia floated up north. Now, this is learning by learning, and it's the second force of business. It's the one thing that we don't always have the time for. It's easier to keep doing what we're doing instead of learning a new skill. To try and figure out why Antarctica got so cold, or how some software program works, it takes up a lot of time. It sucks up all of that time, all of that energy. And then there are all these books that we buy, that we're supposed to read, all of these podcasts that we have to listen to, and all of the courses that have to be looked into. And they all come at us at this current-like pace, spinning round and round and round and round. I listen to a lot of podcasts, lots of audiobooks, watch a lot of videos, and I realize that I'm not reading as much. I wasn't even finishing my copy of The New Yorker, which I usually finish in a couple of days. And I realize that I've not allocated enough time for this activity. That's what I used to do in previous years. I got so tied up with the doing, with the courses, with everything that was more important that learning dropped precipitously. One of the core forces of business involves learning by learning. To be exceedingly smart at what you do, the learning needs to consist of reading, audio, well, even if you're not a big audio fan, video, learning programs. All of this learning is mind-boggling. It can be very exhausting, very intimidating at times. Yet, it's one of the most vital forces of business. It's what keeps you on top of things in a way that Facebook or listening to yet another political debate can never do for you. There is, of course, the downside for this type of learning. I see people who read book after book after book but never do anything. They always hope to do something. They always plan to do it, but they never do. They spend a lot of their time in learning from books, from audio, from video, from courses, from live events, but never doing. To progress, you need both forms of learning. Both of them need to move together, not exactly simultaneously, but they both need to move forward. No matter what the barriers, you need to keep on doing. Failure will come and failure will go and you'll learn from them and move ahead. But it's also important to keep your focus on learning through books, through audio, through video. When I do a self-audit, I know that I've slipped in the books department. I'm aware that audio has never been a problem. And yet, an audiobook is not the same as reading a book. And this is the really frustrating part for me, because there's so much information, so much stuff that I want to know, and there's so much pulling at me, and I'm sure I'm talking for you as well. And you can feel this pressure, this intimidation. And what I've started to do is to understand that I don't need to do it all. I don't need to go to every course and I don't need to do everything. It sounds like, okay, you should have figured this part out a long time ago. But the point is that you want to do it. It's not like you don't want to do it. You want to learn more. And yet what's causing that problem is that I wasn't allocating time for it and I wasn't sticking to that time. And if you don't allocate time for it, then you always say, I have no time for this email. I have no time for this audio. I have no time for any of this stuff. And we find this with everything in our lives, that if we don't allocate time, then it will not get done. For instance, just the learning through 
my watercolor diaries. I couldn't get that done for a simple reason was I wouldn't allocate time for it. Before, I would always paint after breakfast, no matter how busy I was. And then I started making excuses. I had a podcast to record. I had something else to do. And I stopped allocating time for it. So to learn by learning, you have to allocate time for it. But these are just the two forces, the learning by learning and learning by doing. There's also a third force, and that is client retention. That is revenue generation. We still have to earn a living. So how do we do that? When I started out at Psychotactics, I first heard the definition of the word client. According to Webster's Dictionary, the definition of the client was one who comes under your care, your protection, and your guidance. For a lot of people, this definition rings true. They want their customers to be like their child. They want to care, protect, and guide them. And yet, you can do too much. Back in 2006, I started a program. You know about it. It was called the Protégé Program. It covered a lot of disciplines from copywriting, PR, information products, lots of five or six of them, actually, courses that we covered in a single year. And that class alone was generating over $150,000 a year. But by 2008, I stopped that course. And there were two reasons. The first was that I felt I was covering too much material in a single year. Going through the Protégé course was like having to learn five languages or six languages a year. But the secondary reason for stopping the course was simply that I wasn't able to pay as much attention to the rest of the clients. You've experienced this in a classroom. A teacher has her favorite students. They get most of the attention. And it's not like the other students are neglected, but there is a sense of giving more to one section of the students than others. And in a business, focusing a lot on some clients and not on the others can be a pretty bad idea. You have to work on the care, the protection and guidance of as many clients as possible. And that was when the penny dropped. We couldn't work with hundreds of clients. We had to work with a fewer number of clients. Psychotactics gets about 90% of its revenue from about 500 clients. But it's always a big balancing act. You have to have time to help clients through their issues. But no matter what you do, there's always a brutal fact that some of them will leave. When I started 5000 BC, I thought that the clients would stay forever. And many of them have stayed for as long as 10 years, some even 13 years, which is longer than forever on the internet. But eventually, clients do leave. You then face with this nice big black hole if you haven't been working on getting new clients. And this bugged me a lot. Most people like the pleasure of the hunt, that boom, boom, boom of the hunt. And I don't like it. I don't care so much about getting new clients. I'm happier retaining the clients. I'm happy and not having to worry about new clients. And I would be excited, exhilarated even, if everyone stuck around forever. However, that's not the way that things work, which is why this third force is kind of a balancing act. It is to keep clients and to get new clients at the same time. In the end, just a few activities have made the biggest difference. I know the 80-20 principle, and I know that a lot of people might think that it's 80-20 that rules. But for us, it's not been 80-20 at all. It's just been that we've been more comfortable in some areas. We've been more comfortable in podcasting. We've been more comfortable in email, and we've persisted. And over the years, that subtle persistence and changes in strategy have worked for us. But this third force of business takes a lot of time. To care, to protect, and to guide your clients takes a ton of time. And then somehow, in your free time, you have to go out and get new clients. Now, we've been in this business of marketing since the year 2000. 
I thought it would get easier over time, and it doesn't. You still have to allocate a good amount of time to just keep clients and to get new clients as well. Your strategy is going to depend on what you do. I do have one quick tip about this point of getting new clients though. Once you find out what you do, do a lot of it. If you decide to write books on Amazon, write a lot of books. If you do guitar videos on YouTube, do a ton of them. And this is because once clients find you and they like you, they binge on your work. I'll say this again. Once clients find you and they like you, they have to find more work. They have to binge on your work. And if they don't find a lot of your work, they go elsewhere. And of course, everyone says you have to decide what you want to do. You don't have to decide what you want to do. Just decide what you can do right now and then do a lot of it. And maybe you'll have to change it somewhere down the line. We started out as a cartooning business. We went into marketing, which was to retain clients. We have gone into building skill. And there has been this change over 10, 15 years. The point is, you don't have to decide what you want to do. You just do what you have to do, but do a lot of it right now. And we had to take our own advice. When we started out podcast, or rather restarted it back in 2014, we had no idea whether it would work, but we got going with it all the same. For a good two years, the download figures stayed more or less the same. We got almost no email from clients. Our reviews on iTunes barely made it past 100 reviews. Still, the sales of the product kept going up steadily, month by month. And then for some unknown reason, the downloads increased by 20%, then up to 25%. Having all of these podcasts, all of this information, it's helped to do both things simultaneously. To get and to keep clients. This getting and keeping, it's a force of business. You have to allocate time for it as well. And it can distract you, it can distract me from something that we truly love. And that's something are our passion projects. But we won't go into passion projects just this time around. And that's because it's time for a summary on part one of this episode of the five forces that govern our business. So what did we cover today? The first thing that we ran into was learning by doing. It's not like I have to go out there and give yet another presentation. It's not like I have to do yet another course. We're quite comfortable as we are. And even if you're not comfortable, even if you're striving to where you want to be, you have to do the learning by doing. You have to do the courses, do the speaking, do the things that kind of make you uncomfortable, then make you too comfortable, because all along the way you are learning something by doing it. And then there is learning by learning, which becomes increasingly difficult because it's so easy to go jumping from one book to another, one course to another. And it's not like you don't do that because that's cross-pollination. I do that all the time. But what's more important is I have to sit down every week and I do this on Fridays and I have to plan my learning time. And if I don't plan that time, if I don't allocate that time, and this involves learning cooking and learning painting and learning all the other stuff of my life as well, but specifically about the business, about reading the books, about doing those home study courses that I need to do, all of that stuff I need time for. And I have to allocate the time, otherwise it won't happen. And that's when you start to say, well, I don't have any time. Well, you're not going to have any time. There is no time in the future. That time is now. And we just have to allocate the time and forget the overwhelm. Just allocate the time. You say, I'm going to spend 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And that's it. And you do it in those 30 minutes. And the third thing that we covered was revenue generation and client retention. Now, we didn't go through how do you go about this client retention. But what we realized is that we can't just retain clients. Or we can't just say, let's get clients. That's what I used to think. I would go, okay, if I just retain all the clients, that's fine. Then I never have to get any clients anymore. 
but that's not how it works. Clients leave. They always leave because that's the nature of the business. That's the nature of who we are. And so you have to have both of them going at the same time. And I know what this sounds like. This sounds like a lot of work. And it is a lot of work. That's what business is all about. But you get to run your own business. You don't have to sit in an office. You don't have to sit in a cubicle and get someone tell you what to do. So yes, the work doesn't go away. But technically, at least, you have your own time. And you can decide what you're going to do with that time. These are the three forces of business that we covered today. What is the one thing that you can do today? The one thing that you can do today is to make time to plan. Most people just go about their stuff week to week, month to month, and they just fall into projects and fall into learning and fall into everything. And it's been very difficult for us to just say, okay, we have to spend this 20 minutes or 30 minutes or sometimes even an hour just planning for the long term, which is six months or a year, but also the next week. It doesn't always go according to plan. Things change, but that's how it'll work. That's how things will start to work for you. The planning is more critical than anything else. You plan for learning by doing, you plan for learning by learning, and you plan for client retention and client acquisition. You allocate that time. And that's how the business starts to grow and, more importantly, sustain itself so you don't have these ups and downs. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. So what's happening in Psychotactics land? Well, we just got back, well, I'm saying we just got back, but we got back three weeks ago from Scandinavia, from the Netherlands, and from Singapore. So that was like a northern adventure. And as you know, I went there to speak at an event, at Brennan Dunn's event, and then, so we were briefly in Sweden, and then we spent half a month in Denmark, and then moved for a week to the Netherlands and Singapore. And most of the time, what we're doing is we're not going out there and looking at stuff. We're just eating, drinking, sleeping, reading, talking, if we have friends, meeting friends. But we also had a couple of meetups, just two or three hour events. Well, it started out as two or three hours. We had these meetups and they started at 8.30 or 9.30 and went on till 12.30 and then spilled over to lunch. (laughs) And that was another two or three hours. And in some cases, to dinner. So that was a pretty long day, for, especially for an introvert like Renuka. For me, it was great because I enjoy the company of people and I get more chats than ever before. But yeah, we, we enjoyed meeting with clients and not necessarily talking about business. It was mostly beer and drinks and food and that kind of thing. It's so good to have clients that are like your friends, that, you know, you don't have this pressure. And that's what Psychotactics has done for us. It has really made our business so much fun to deal with people that are respectful, that are friendly, that are helpful. To me, that factor of to guide, to protect, that definition of a client is probably the most powerful of all. We did talk a little about business. People asked about the article writing course. The article writing course, as you know, we were supposed to do it like live online this year, but we've suspended all courses and I'm going to cover that next time in downtime until next year, July, somewhere there. That's when I'm going to do courses online. But on the 18th of September, you can get access to the home study version. It's a lot cheaper than the live version, and it's a really good course. We did that through learning by doing, by figuring out what causes clients to struggle with their article writing, to struggle with how to start the article, how to construct it so that a reader just goes through it and goes, wow, this is an amazing article. And... That learning by doing is seen in that article writing course, which will be available on the 18th of September. But 
you have to be on that list, on that home study list. And once we sell out the 35 copies that we have, we stop. I know it's a home study. I know we should be selling a lot of them, but we're happy with what we do and 35 copies later, it's gone. So go to psychotactics.com and go to the article writing page, get on the list. And on the 18th of September, that's when you'll get your notification to buy the product. But even if you're not getting into the article writing course, you can get into 5000 BC. 5000 BC is a place where introverts gather, where we talk about stuff, we answer questions, and you enjoy yourself. There's lots of information in 5000 BC, but what's important is what's important to you right now. So get to 5000 BC, we'll see you there. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye from 607 AM land. And we'll come back next week for part two of the five forces of business. Bye for now.